So there's been a question in biology for a long period of time, and that question is, are viruses alive? There are six characteristics that have to be met to say that a cell is alive. The first characteristic is that there must be organization. On the left-hand side of the screen in blue, you're seeing a cell type called a eukaryote. This is what makes up you, as well as other animals and plants. You'll notice that there's a lot of internal structures within this eukaryotic cell. We call these membrane-bound organelles, and you can think of these as little organs. For example, this center nucleus in the cell contains the DNA or genetic material of the cell. This is the brain of the cell. It controls the cell and tells the cell what to do. Lysosomes you could think of as the little stomach of the cell. They digest materials just like your stomach. And we could go through each one of those organelles and discuss what they do. But in order to be alive, that eukaryotic cell needs that organization. It needs those organelles. Now on the right-hand side of the screen, much simpler, shown in red and yellow here, is a bacterial cell. These are microscopic. You cannot see these without a microscope. And even though they're very simple inside, you'll notice there's no nucleus or mitochondria or lysosomes, they are still organized and they still are considered to be alive. Viruses also share the characteristic of having organization. For a virus to be infective, it really needs two structures. One, is a glycoprotein spike. On the image here in red, you're seeing glycoprotein spikes of a virus called the coronavirus. These glycoprotein spikes are what attach to cells in order for the virus to infect the cells. The other thing that's required for a virus to be infective is some sort of genetic material. Now eukaryotes like humans and prokaryotes those bacteria that we just talked about, they both use DNA primarily as their genetic material. Viruses can use DNA, but they can also use another type of genetic material called RNA. The coronavirus happens to have RNA as its genetic material. The big difference is that viruses with RNA mutate more rapidly than a cell with DNA. Now, another characteristic of life is that cells need to acquire materials and produce their own energy. The mitochondrion, or mitochondria, if there's more than one in a eukaryotic cell, is the powerhouse. This is able to produce energy well. Your eukaryotic cells acquire materials through your digestive tract. In the case of those little microscopic bacteria, they tend to secrete digestive enzymes out. You can think of it as the bacteria spitting out. And then once those materials around it have been dissolved, they slurp it back up. They're also capable of making their own energy. They don't have mitochondria to do that, but the same basic chemical processes occur to produce energy in both of these types of cells. In contrast, a virus does not meet this characteristic. It does not acquire materials and it doesn't produce energy. There are no digestive or energy producing functions within a virus. A virus infects a host cell and relies completely on that host cell to produce the materials and energy that it needs. Another characteristic of life is that organisms maintain homeostasis or they are homeostatic. This basically means that there is an internal balance. Things like body temperature, pH, salt content, those are all maintained in homeostasis in the human body as well as in other plants and animals. The cute dog here is maintaining homeostasis by panting on a hot day. When the dog pants, the tongue is wet from the saliva and air cools the blood in the tongue before it circulates back into the body. So a dog's tongue is basically its air conditioning system. It's using that to maintain homeostasis. 
Viruses do not need this characteristic of life. They cannot maintain homeostasis. They have no mechanisms available or structures available to maintain a balance. Another characteristic of life is that life responds to stimuli. On the left here in blue, you're seeing a pufferfish. This pufferfish has responded to a threat by increasing its body size and sticking out those little pokey pieces to try to get itself out of a bad situation. Plants also respond to stimuli. Certain types of sunflowers will track the sun as it moves across the sky. That flower will actually rotate with that stalk. The reason for this is that warmer surfaces attract more pollinators, and that's what the sunflower is aiming to do. But these are both great examples of a living organism responding to a stimulus, a change. In comparison, viruses do not meet this characteristic of life. They can't respond to a stimulus, a change. Now on the left, with a black background, you're seeing something that might look like an alien robot or something that should land on Mars. This is actually a reconstructed image of a bacteriophage. This is a virus that attacks bacteria. On the right, with the gray background, you're seeing what kind of looks like spaghetti noodles. That is the structure of Ebola. Neither one of these viruses and none that have been studied can respond to stimuli. Another characteristic of life is that life needs to reproduce and grow, otherwise the species would go extinct. On the left with the red background, you're seeing a plate of bacteria. Now remember bacteria, those prokaryotes are too small to see. What you're seeing here then are billions of bacteria stacked together. They've been streaked across that plate, kind of like someone would take a pencil and scratch it back and forth. And then of course on the right, we're looking at the growth and reproduction of the human species. Viruses do not meet this characteristic. They do not reproduce and they do not grow. Viruses rely on a host cell to make more viruses. On the left here with the white background, you're seeing how a virus might enter a host cell. These little orange spikes are what need to bind to receptors, these little blue proteins on the surface of the cell. This gray line here represents the plasma membrane of the cell. You can think of that as the skin of the cell. When that virus's spikes here bind to those blue proteins, that pulls the virus inside and releases its genetic material. That genetic material is then going to take over that cell instead of the cell listening to the nucleus and the DNA there, it now listens to the genetic material of the virus. And we don't see baby viruses and adult viruses. Viruses are made by parts. So when that virus infects that cell, it's going to tell the cell to make proteins and DNA or RNA, and to then assemble all those pieces together into what we call a virion. And a virion is a mature infectious viral particle. Now to get out of the cell, this particular virus is going to approach the plasma membrane of the cell. We're now looking at the picture on the right, and it's going to pull some of the host cell's plasma membrane. Again, think of that as the skin. It's going to pull that away and coat itself in that plasma membrane. Inside that plasma membrane, we have some protein, we have genetic material, and on the outside, we have those glycoprotein spikes needed to bind to the next host cell and infect the next host cell. Our last characteristic of life is that organisms have evolutionary history. Kind of brings us back to the chicken and the egg debate, which came first. Well, if you talk to a zoologist, someone who studies evolution of life on our planet, they'll tell you that eggs came before chickens. Chickens are certainly not the only species to reproduce with an egg. Now, the evolutionary tree of life does not include viruses at all. And there's a lot of debate about what viruses are. 
Some researchers would say that viruses were one of the first very simplest structures produced on our planet. Others think maybe viruses came from outer space. The others think that viruses were once cells that got really lazy. They figured out they could infect another cell, take that cell over, and that cell that was infected would do everything for them. That's still under debate, although most researchers are going with the first explanation. The viruses do not share an evolutionary history per se. So are viruses alive? The answer is no. The reasons are that they don't meet all six characteristics that are needed to say that something is alive. They don't acquire materials and energy. They don't maintain homeostasis. They don't respond to stimuli and they don't grow and reproduce. Remember, viruses are considered to be particles. They infect cells and infected cells are told to make more viruses. Those viruses are released and try to infect 